welcome back. We expect to go live to Georgia very soon, back into the courtroom. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce my guest, Neil Getnick, who is a former prosecutor. So happy to have you here. Great to be here. Thank you. So let's talk about, in my opinion, what is the central issue here. She is only being charged with one count of murder and not two, although we will talk about two instances of homicide. She's only being charged once. Why? Well, I think what we're seeing here are some very creative tactics on the part of the prosecution, because the prosecution just didn't know whether they'd be able to get in this similar act evidence. So by going for the earlier crime first, they preserve their option. They get it in. Now they have the ability to go forward with a very potentially uh, strong piece of evidence. And even if they are not successful in um, getting the conviction, they now have the option of going forward in a second case with the more recent crime uh, standing on its own. So it's a two bites of the apple approach, and I think that's what you're seeing here. I guess so, but the question is, how did they know that it would be found admissible? I mean, to me, that was a big chance to take. Well, I don't think they did know whether it would be found and admissible. And why not go for it all at one time? Well, I think that they didn't know if it would be found admissible, and so, therefore, if they have to lose one rather than the other, lose the older one, and, and now have the ability to go forward uh, with the more recent one, uh, and in addition to that, um, you don't have the problem of potential double jeopardy by losing it all at once. So again, I'll say two bites at the apple. Uh, this is a pretty horrendous case if what is being alleged is true, and between two juries, the odds really go up that a conviction will result. One murder conviction is going to be enough to accomplish the prosecution's purpose. Well, let's talk about the admissibility for a moment. Sure. Not exactly usual. No, a very unusual case, but then again, it's not exactly usual that one woman would be connected to two murders, allegedly two murders, uh, under such unusual circumstances. And what could the defense have done to keep it out? Well, I think the defense did exactly what they were supposed to do. They put in strong, good arguments. They, they pointed out that uh, there's no allegation regarding either the method of ingestion or the time of ingestion. The only thing that the, the defense says that the prosecution says is that the uh, defendant had access to the deceased and that's just not enough. So they made that argument and then they really pounded it in saying this is to inflame the jury, it's to confuse the jury, it's to unfairly prejudice their result. They did everything they were supposed to do, I think, from the standpoint of making their best arguments, but they simply didn't prevail. It's a fascinating circumstantial case. Well, stay with us. We're going to go now back to the opening statements in this incredible case. Glenn Turner started to work as a Cobb County police officer in 1985. He first met Lynn Womack around 1989. In 1991, Glenn Womack began working with the Cobb County Police Department as a 911 operator. Lynn Turner likes to spend money. The evidence will show that she lived well above her means. Glenn and Lynn sound so much alike. In fact, my wife says when I'm saying it, she can't tell the difference. That I'm going to use Lynn when I, I mean defendant, when I'm talking about Lynn. Several months before their marriage, Glenn moved into the defendant's home on Old, Old Farm Walk in Cobb County, where they lived together. They continued to live together until their marriage in August. On August the 21st, 1993, Glenn Turner married Lynn Womack. And they took a honeymoon cruise. The marriage started downhill shortly after they returned from that cruise. But nevertheless, on August the 30th, 1993, Glenn Turner made Lynn Turner the defendant, the beneficiary of the county's standard life insurance policy. Three weeks later, on September the 23rd, Glenn made the defendant the beneficiary of a $100,000 life insurance policy with MetLife. In the spring or early summer of 1994, the defendant was in coming Forsyth County, Georgia, she had family in Forsyth, where she met a young deputy sheriff, later a firefighter, named Randy Thomas. She visited 
visited with him on many occasions in Cummins during the summer and fall of 1994 while she's still married to Glenn Turner. In the latter part of 1994, Randy Thompson decided to move to Warner Robins to live with his parents who had moved there in November. On December the 2nd, 1994, Shane Williams, a good friend of Randy's and her defendants, gave a going away party for Randy in Cummins. This party actually lasted over several days or two days because Randy's friends were public service employees and he wanted all of his friends to be able to attend. Even his parents, Mr. and Ms. Thompson, attended one night. After Randy moved, the defendant would drive down to Warner Robins on weekends and stay at the Thompson's residence visiting with Randy. This even occurred around Christmas of 1994. She was building a relationship with another family while she's still married to Glenn Turner. During this time, the defendant is trying to get Randy to move back to Cummins. And finally, in February of 1995, the defendant does move back to Cummins. Then over the weekend of February the 19th, 1995, the defendant and Randy, along with some of their friends, go to the Daytona 500 races in Florida. While they're at the races, Glenn is at home working at a service station, a part-time job, so that he can help pay the bills. He's planning on talking to her when she gets back, and either they're going to resolve their issues, or he's going to move out. Less than two weeks after this Daytona 500 trip, Glenn is sick. He goes to the Kennesaw Hospital on March the 2nd, 1995. He is suffering from nausea, vomiting, flu-like symptoms. We're going to take a break here, but first, what do you think about the case against Lynn Turner? Send us an email with your comments. Our address is opencourt at courttv.com. We'll be right back. Wednesday, on an all-new Masterminds, he went into the jungle and came out with a lie worth its weight in gold. The largest gold deposit in the world. See how the fool scientists sparked the Wall Street frenzy. Investors looked at the rising stock price and said, this must be real. And made billions from a gold mine that didn't exist. The biggest fraud of all time. But can he pull off the world's greatest disappearing act? He jumped out of the helicopter. An all-new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. I'm a cowboy. I'm a cowboy. We're cowboys too. We just became cowboys. Yeehaw, baby! All kinds of people are becoming cowboys these days. Eastwood Insurance Cowboys, that is. You get low, low rates, nice, friendly service, and an honest company you can trust. That's why I'm a cowboy. You can be a cowboy too. So call Eastwood Insurance today and start saving money the cowboy way. Eastwood. The biggest show on television. The biggest new stars in music. The only record that has them all. American Idol Season 3, Greatest Soul Classic. The biggest soul hits ever recorded, like you've never heard them before. Aretha Franklin's classic, Chain of Fools, by Fantasia Barino. The all-time favorite, You Are Everything, from John Stevens. George Huff's version of the classic, Me and Mrs. Jones. Memphis, Mrs. Jones. Latoya London sings the number one hit song, If You Don't Know Me By Now. The Gladys Knight Smash, Midnight Train to Georgia from Jasmine Trias. On the Midnight Train to Georgia. The classic, I Heard It Through the Grapevine from Diana DeGarmo. Plus, John Peter Lewis, Jennifer, Camille, and all of the top 12 American Idol finalists you selected. American Idol Season 3, Greatest Soul Classics. Get your copy today. Call the number on your screen. 
For years, the kids have called me their guardian angel. When I got cancer and the chemo made me anemic and weak, I tried to keep working, but I just couldn't. Then I got this card. Come back soon. I had to do something. If you or someone you love are on chemo, call this number now to receive important information about Procrit. Procrit is for chemotherapy-related anemia in patients with most kinds of cancer. Procrit helps rebuild red blood cells lost during chemotherapy. And more red blood cells can mean more strength. Call now for helpful information on how to manage chemo side effects and how to find out if you could be anemic. Procrit is proven and safe. In studies, only diarrhea and edema occurred more often with Procrit than placebo. So talk to your doctor. Call now and learn how Procrit can help you get back the strength you need. Your strength for living. I'm back and there's no stopping me. Wednesday on an all-new Forensic Files. It's the toughest test yet for DNA experts. It's very difficult sometimes. So they sent this tissue to a pure pathologist. When a popular high school teacher is reported missing. There's absolutely no way my father would just up and leave. Can studying the family tree help forensic investigators crack the case? You want to make damn sure that this is the right guy? Find out on an all-new Forensic Files. Wednesday at 9, right here on Court TV. Welcome back to Georgia v. Turner. We're going to go back to Friday's courtroom where we'll hear from Prosecutor Pat Head and more of his opening statement. Glenn is treated at the hospital. He's released to go home on the morning of March the 3rd, 1995. The defendant leaves the house on the morning of March the 3rd and she later told the police that she was going out to run some errands. She returns home around 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon and she finds Glenn in bed, dead. She calls 911 and she tells the police when they respond that they had been to the Kennesaw Hospital the previous day where Glenn had been treated for flu-like symptoms, that he was released and after returning home he went to bed. But around 3 o'clock in the morning, she awoke and found Glenn acting irrational, delusional, thinking someone was in the house. That he went into the basement, complaining that he was thirsty, and picked up a jar of what appeared to be gasoline. She took it away from him. She was able to get him back upstairs. She said she gave him a large glass of water, which he drank, and then he went to bed. Her version of what occurred that evening will vary from witness to witness. Between 8.30 and 9 o'clock on the morning of March the 3rd, she says Glenn awoke and got up complaining of weakness. She said he ate some jello, that he was going back to bed. She advised him that she needed to go run some errands. The later investigation in 2001 by the GBI reveals that she actually went to the Chevron station where Glenn worked, operated by Ms. Judith Hendricks, and there she kills time for several hours. When asked by Ms. Hendricks why she's not at home taking care of Glenn, she said, well, he was up earlier in the, in the morning and he was acting a little, little irrational, but he ate some jello and he's okay. Ms. Hendricks insisted that the defendant should be home taking care of Glenn. A cursory review of the home by the Cobb County investigators on the morning of March the 3rd and even on March the 4th didn't reveal any criminal activity. The medical examiner performed an autopsy and although he found calcium oxalate crystals in the kidney, he failed to recognize the significance of those crystals at the time. He determined that the cause of death was natural. He labeled it heart failure or cardiac megaly or cardiac dysrhythmia. <clears throat> Glenn's funeral was held on March the 6th, 1995. The evidence will show that at both the viewing at the funeral home and at the funeral, 
The conduct of the defendant was not that of a grieving widow. Four days after Glenn's funeral, on March the 10th, 1995, Glenn Turner moved into an apartment in Cummings with Randy Thompson. Randy's actually listed on the lease as an occupant. And then the defendant starts collecting benefits <coughs> from Glenn's death. On March the 1st, 1995, she starts receiving $752.71 from Glenn Turner's retirement from the county. On March the 18th, 1995, <coughs> Just over $100,000 from the MetLife policy is paid to the defendant. And on May the 12th, 1995, she receives the county insurance of $47,587.50. The defendant and Randy together with another couple that were friends of Randy's, go on a seven-day cruise in June of 1995. They take a limousine from Cummings to the Atlanta airport. They fly to Miami. They take the cruise. When the cruise is over, they fly from Miami back to the Atlanta airport, and they take a limousine back to Cummings. All of the expenses for the trip for both couples are paid for by the defendant. On January the 30th, I'm sorry, on July the 25th, 1995, the defendant files an affidavit with Todd County seeking to have the deferred compensation account of Glenn Turner paid to her. And in her affidavit, she alleges that Glenn made her the the uh, beneficiary for that deferred comp while she was his fiance in May of 1993. Then in August, the defendant buys a new home. On August the 30th, 1995, the defendant and Randy Thompson move into the new home in Cummings. On January the 30th, 1996, even though she and Randy have never been married, and less than a year after Glenn Turner's funeral, Amber Thompson is born, the child of Glenn Turner and Randy Thompson. <clears throat> On January the 13th, 1997, Randy goes to the State Farm Agency in Cummins and applies for a $100,000 life insurance policy, naming the defendant as the beneficiary. On June the 18th, 1998, their second son, Blake, is born. On September the 11th of 1998, Randy returns to the State Farm Agency and increases his life insurance policy from $100,000 to $200,000, naming the defendant as the beneficiary. On April the 1st, 1999, Randy Thompson moves out of the defendant's home and moves into an apartment at the Overlook Club Apartments, where he lived alone until his death. Well, it certainly does not sound too good for Lynn Turner when Pat Head is describing the situation. We have here, we've spoken about a circumstantial case. This is a case completely different from, say, last week when we had Jason Williams. We had a defendant standing there with a shotgun, hand on the trigger, witnesses see him pull the trigger, kill the man, no conviction, no conviction of murder, that is. 
Here we have a woman, we have no store clerk selling her any antifreeze. We can't find the antifreeze. We don't even know how or when she gave it. Was it jello, alcohol? We have no clue. We just have two dead men. And yet you say we have a conviction on our hands. Well, first of all, I think circumstantial evidence is very often misunderstood and, and somehow thought to be weak. Circumstantial evidence can be extraordinarily powerful. So let me give you another example. Uh, someone says, I'm going into that room, I've had it with that person. They go into the room, no one sees what happened. They hear the other person suddenly yell, oh my God, don't stab me. They hear a scream, they come in and they see the person removing um, what appears to be the knife with the blood dripping out of it. But no one saw it. Okay, but Neil, that's not the case here. It's not the case, but come it's... Come on, now that's a big stretch. Not the case, but it's circumstantial evidence. So we were asking the, the viewers before in our poll, would you convict on the basis of circumstantial evidence? And they said yes. And I think the point that you're making is it all comes down to the quality of the circumstantial evidence. So I'll discuss that, the oh, quality of the circumstantial evidence. You're absolutely evidence. right. And now we also have a, a situation in which we're in a small town. We know we've had a change of venue. Um, for those of you who have been following this, the, the judge actually had to move the case to another town because he was so concerned that people had heard too much about the case, and that often happens. But we're still in, in a small town, and we're still in Georgia, in which this is a big-time case, as we've said before. It's the first time antifreeze has ever been used, and this is big news in Georgia. So do we think they're actually listening to the evidence, the jury, or have they already made their minds up? Well, I think they're listening to the evidence, but I think that the, well, first of all, there is no evidence yet, right? They're listening to the opening statements, and it's, it's really part of the situation that we all find ourselves in Point as well. well taken. That we hear this coming in, and we consider it evidence. I mean, how many of us can ask ourselves, have we formed an opinion on the basis of this case? We're not the jurors. We're not sworn not to do that, and how difficult their job is right now. But just picking up on your point, separate out the fact for the moment that there are two instances, and take either of these individually on their own, how does that case impress us? And I think that's the point you're making that's very well taken, that without the two interlocking potential cases, it becomes a much more difficult stretch to say there's enough in any one instance. So it all hinges on the ability to pull them together. Yeah. Let's go back to what the defense says. They're saying if that's the case, there's the prejudice. And with live coverage on Court TV, you never know. We could uh, have a witness come forward, and that store clerk might be just amongst us. We don't even know it yet. Stay with us. We are planning to go live back to Georgia to hear more of this scintillating case. Legal flashback, May 3rd, 2000. More than 11 years after the airline tragedy, the trial of two suspects in the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 begins in the Netherlands. Wednesday, on an all-new Masterminds, he went into the jungle and came out with a lie worth its weight in gold. This is the largest gold deposit in the world. See how he fooled scientists, sparked a Wall Street frenzy. Investors looked at the rising stock price and said, this must be real. And made billions from a gold mine that didn't exist. The biggest fraud of all time. But can he pull off the world's greatest disappearing act? He jumped out of the helicopter. An all-new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. Want your perfect PC with award-winning service and support? Then you want a Dell. Call or go online now and get this Dimension desktop with an Intel Pentium 4 processor and three years at-home service for just $6.99 at the mail-in rebate. This system also includes an all-in-one printer. Plus, get free two-day shipping. For rock-solid 24-7 service and support, you're getting a Dell. This offer ends May 5th, and it's only a click or call away. Easy as Dell. Dell PCs use Intel Pentium 4 processors. Want peace of mind from your PC? Then you want a Dell. Dell PCs received an A-plus for service and reliability. Just call or go online now and get this Dimension desktop with a powerful Intel Pentium 4 processor for the amazing price of $4.99 after mail-in rebate. And right now, get free two-day shipping and a free CD burner. Notebooks start at $7.49. But hurry, these offers end May 5th, and they're only a click or call away. Easy as Dell. Dell PCs use Intel Pentium 4 processors. Your late charges are stacking up. 
I didn't get a check from you last month. Can you at least pay the minimum? It's a shopping and credit report. Account is late again. You know it, I call really 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 take care of it. When the collection for closing in, call In Charge Debt Solutions. We're a nonprofit company that puts people back in control of their lives by helping them manage their debt. We'll stop the collection calls and we'll help lower your interest rates so you'll have one affordable monthly payment. Call In Charge today. The Cato woman, she's a lot like you. She wants the selection of a specialty store, the quality of a department store, and the prices of a discount store. step to digital cable was the smartest choice I've ever made. Maybe my luck is changing. Upgrade to an Adelphia value pack today and save up to 20%. The reasons are obvious. The best premium channels, CD quality music, and choices that fit the way I live. Get Adelphia digital cable and save with this limited time offer. Bring it all home with Adelphia. Welcome to the 2004 MTV Movie Awards. Wait, who are they? Hold on to your seats as you and a friend fly to L.A. Your spine will tingle as you stay at a swanky hotel. Your hair will stand on end as you arrive in style at the big show and contest winner party. One second prize winner will receive a one for all Chameleon Remote and Movie Awards DVD collection. Someone in your town is guaranteed to win, so hurry and enter. Visit your Atlanta area Hyundai dealer for your chance to win a trip to the 2004 MTV Movie Awards. With Hyundai, you win. Has a 14-year-old boy been wrongly accused? Find out on the interrogation of Michael Crow at 8. Then it's Forensic Files at 9 and the Hog Trail Murders at 10. Did Julia Lynn Womack Turner poison not one, but two men in her life? Welcome back to Court TV's Open Court. I'm Sloan Lindemann. Turner is charged with only one murder, that of her husband. But prosecutors believe she also killed her former lover the exact same way, by poisoning him with antifreeze. But Turner insists she is no killer. Let's go back and take another look at the prosecutor's opening statement. During 1999, the defendants visit the local animal shelter, and she inquires about substances that they use to put animals to death. An employee there tells her they call it purple stuff. During 2000 and 2001, prior to Randy's death, the defendant is in bad financial shape, problems with credit cards and overdrawn accounts. On January the 3rd, 2001, she is in Regions Bank, in Cummings, about her overdrawn account. And she indicates she'll be able to take care of it soon. January the 19th, Friday, 2001. Randy cancels plans to have dinner with a friend so that he can have dinner with Lynn Turner, the defendant and they go to Longhorn Steakhouse. <clears throat> the next day, on January 20th, 2001, Saturday, Randy's sick. He's vomiting, hallucinating, nauseous, flu-like symptoms. Randy calls his friend, another fireman, around 7.30 in the morning, who comes over and cares for him all day. Other friends come over that day as well. The defendant also comes over that day. And then late Saturday evening, Randy's carried to the Joan Clancy Hospital where, like Lynn, he is treated and released to go home. <clears throat> On January the 21st, Sunday, Randy's sick all day, but he's visited by the defendant. 
Monday. Randy is discovered dead by a fireman friend sometime around mid morning. <coughs> On January the 22nd, that same Monday, the defendant calls the Social Security Administration to find out about payment of benefits to her for Randy's children. Within a week, the defendant calls the State Farm Agency about the $200,000 life insurance policy. But she finds out the policy lapsed. An autopsy is performed. Dr. Capone, the medical examiner for the state of Georgia, finds calcium oxalate crystals in the kidneys. And so he suspects ethylene glycol poisoning. He asked that toxicology perform tests in the blood for the presence of ethylene glycol. The lab reported the testing as negative for a significant quantity of ethylene glycol. So without a toxicology finding of ethylene glycol, the medical examiner reported the death as natural causes. Although he didn't issue the autopsy until May. Natural causes, cardiac dysrhythmia, cardiac megalia, heart failure, the same as Glenn Turner. Dr. Capone received a call from Randy Thompson's parents. Mr. and Ms. Thompson raised questions about Randy's death. They had a meeting with Dr. Caponin, at which time Dr. Caponin learned that a Cobb County police officer, Glenn Turner, had died in 1995 under similar circumstances. And again, the common denominator, the defendant. She was married to Glenn at the time of his death. Dr. Caponin then contacted Dr. Fritz, who is the medical examiner for Cobb County. And he asked for the autopsy report on Glenn, and he asked for the tissue samples that were taken in 1995. After reviewing this data, Dr. Caponin discovered that calcium oxalate crystals had also been found in Glenn Turner's kidneys, but that the medical examiner had not asked for any toxicology testing for ethylene glycol. These calcium oxalate crystals, the same as were found in Randy Thompson. Dr. Caponin then contacted the GBI Forensic Toxicology Department and asked that they retest the blood and urine samples from Randy. The retest resulted in a finding of ethylene glycol. <laughs> the toxicologist at the Georgia Forensic Department, Chris Tilson, will tell you that he made a mathematical error in his first test. Therefore, the number that he thought he had in that first test, which I believe the evidence will show you was 38, that that number should actually have been 10 times that a number, 380. And even though there was a number, that number being 38, that was below the number that the crime lab will report when they do testing. And that it was because of that low number that the report was negative but negative for a significant quantity of ethylene glycol. When he realized he had made this error and compared the first test after making the correction in his math so that the number then reported was 380, that number was statistically close to the numbers that he got on his subsequent test. The GBI was called into the case on June the 20th, 2001 to investigate Thompson's death as a homicide. Special Agent David King was assigned as the lead investigator for the Thompson homicide. 
because of the similarities between the two deaths in two separate jurisdictions, that being Cobb County and Forsyth County, the GBI was also requested to handle both investigations. On July the 30th, 2001, Glenn Turner's body was exhumed, was removed from the grave where it had been buried, was taken to the Cobb County Medical Examiner's Office where a second autopsy was then performed. In September 2001, a company called National Medical Services was requested to do toxicology testing of Glenn's liver for the presence of ethylene glycol. There was a positive result. They did find ethylene glycol. Same symptoms, same illness, same poison, and two deaths. Stay with us as we expect to go live to Georgia for testimony straight from the courtroom. looked at the rising stock price and said, this must be real. And made billions from a gold mine that didn't exist. The biggest fraud of all time. But can he pull off the world's greatest disappearing act? He jumped out of the helicopter. An all-new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. save you 15% or more on car insurance. At Miracle Ear, right now you can get the best we have to offer at your biggest savings ever. Our most advanced digital hearing system is yours with savings of $2,000. That's right, save $2,000. This special offer is available only at Miracle Ear. So visit one of our 1,000 nationwide locations, many in Sears stores, or call toll-free 1-888-504-4411 to find the location nearest you. But hurry, after May 26th, this exclusive offer will be history. Every home has them. Tuck marks on walls. How'd those get there? Scuffs on floors. And that tough dirt you never thought you could easily clean. Until now. Introducing Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. There's nothing else like it. You just use water. Then Mr. Clean Magic Eraser goes to work. Amazing. But wait. There's more. Its innovative material gets into those tiny surface textures that trap dirt and grime and magically erases it away. Say bye-bye, Crayon. Use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser again and again until it disappears. That was so easy. Here's what other folks say about Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. It takes marks off the floor, off the walls, off the shoes. I think it will change the way you clean. It does, like the name says, it erases things like you would not believe. Try it risk-free. If you're not completely satisfied, call for your money back. Go to this website now to get a coupon that can save you up to 50% off your next purchase of a two-count package of Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. of people have high cholesterol over 240. They diet and exercise like their doctor said and think they're going to be okay. Some will, some won't. Call toll free or go online now for a valuable cholesterol information kit containing important facts you need to know about a treatment proven to lower high cholesterol. Medicine doctors have trusted to help millions. Like anyone with high cholesterol, you have to get your number down. If not, you're at risk, maybe more than you think. High cholesterol may lead to heart disease, which can be fatal for some people. Will you be one of them?
of them. Get your cholesterol number down before it gets to you. Call 1-866-760-0400 or visit cholesterolkit.com now for important cholesterol facts you need. Wednesday, hidden forensic investigators use a family tree to track down a killer. So they sent this tissue to neuropathologist. Find out on an all-new Forensic Files, Wednesday at 9, right here on Court TV. And welcome back to Georgia v. Turner. Can a jury convict a woman of murder? That's what I'd like to talk about now, Neil. I mean, it's not as easy. Let's be realistic. Gender is an issue here. And does the prosecution make up for it in some way? What do they do to counterbalance our general feeling in society that a woman wouldn't commit murder? Well, you hear it to some extent. I think in a reasonable way in terms of the facts that are being put out, but you wonder whether the facts are a little bit more charged because they are a woman. The question is why wasn't she home taking care of her spouse? It's a reasonable question, right. but I think it's a much more charged question when that's being used in the case of a woman defendant than if you were asking about why is a husband not home taking care of his wife when she has the flu. You know, this is not a situation where someone is uh, facing a potential obvious um, fatal illness. Um, why did she take a cruise with her friends? Right. You know, you just sort of have this sense of someone dancing on the grave. But uh, you know, how many people after the loss uh, of a spouse or, or, or a loved one or someone who's close are encouraged by their friends, look, after a period of time, you've, you've got to get out, you've got to get back into society. Uh, again, I think it's a question with a, with a woman. It's a more emotionally charged issue. And so I think there's an uphill battle there. And you see these things being uh, introduced, I think, into the case to sort of put her into a special category uh, so that she doesn't get the benefit of that natural sympathy. Well, I'd like to talk more about this because I think there, it's certainly a very interesting issue, how she presents herself, how is the defense team how is the defense team actually preparing her? But we are actually going to go live now to testimony in the courtroom. Let's take a look. Georgia V. Turner. You go to sports bars, such as, uh, you know, Chili's or any place they served uh, dinner and had a large array of TVs around the room so we could watch, you know, whatever sports program we wanted to watch. Now, when you say sports bar, of course, you know, I'm involved in prosecution. It makes my ears go up. Were you of age at the time? No, sir. It was. It wasn't. You didn't have to show ID to get in the door. You just had to show ID to drink. I imagine. Did, so, did you ever drink while you were? No, sir. At the age of, at the age of 15, I uh, made a conscious decision not to drink alcohol, and uh, I, to this day, I still do not. When you were with Glenn over at his apartment, uh, did you ever have occasion to see any gifts or anything? Yes, I uh, observed. Uh, on one occasion, uh, Lynn had bought him uh, several bottles of liquor. Um, another occasion, she bought him some snakeskin boots, some pants, shirts. Um, she bought him tires for his truck one time. All this was before they got married? Yes, sir. Did you ever work any part-time jobs yourself or do any work for them to, for pay? Yes, sir. I, I, I started to detail with their cars as well. Um, they became regular clients of mine, and um, they'd call me up and ask me if I could fit them in, and I'd always say yes, and they'd either swing by or drop their car off, or I'd go up to the station, pick it up, and detail their cars. Doing this detailing, and prior to that, to the marriage of the defendant and Glenn, did you ever have an occasion to be doing a detailing job for the defendant, and anything remarkable happen? Yes, sir. There was one occasion, one afternoon, I was uh, detailing Lynn's uh, Camaro. It was a warm, sunny, sunny day, and I had my shirt off. No, I was. I want to get, uh, we may need to approach about this particular subject matter. Okay. Why don't you, why don't you come on up? <coughs> so, Neil, we were talking about gender and presentation. How do you think the defense team spoke? with Lynn Turner before she entered the courtroom? 
Well, that's a really interesting question because if you see the, the dress that she's wearing, it's a bright, well, you can see it now, she's a bright colored uh, dress, but it's not a loud dress, so it creates more of an upbeat impression. But I think that in terms of her choice of makeup and the like, it's creating a different impression. And what about her expression? I think that's what's troubled me the most. I, I can almost handle the wardrobe and the makeup, but the, the expression seems so dour and mean. I mean, I think I might have coached her to be a little, I mean, she can't be upbeat. She's on trial for murder, but perhaps not staring down and looking so sour. Well, down, that's exactly the right term. Her mouth is in a frown and downturned. Uh, her lids, her eyelids are consistently down, and because she is wearing this black eyeliner, it really emphasizes that, and you don't have the type of image, I think, that typically the defense would want to present. Neil, you must be a very sensitive man to notice makeup so clearly. <laughs> I'm very impressed. The jury has been sent out, and we are now going to go to break. We'll be back with more live testimony from Georgia. Wednesday. He made billions off a gold mine that didn't exist. One of the biggest frauds in the history of the world. But is he spending his fortune or is he buried six feet under? An all new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. Hey, big. Right here. See this car? I may use one. Red. Got it. Finding the right car is hard. Red. But vehicles.com makes it easy. Well, would you call this red? I'd call it burgundy. Searching hundreds of dealer inventories. I'd call it burgundy. Right, burgundy's not red. And presenting the results. Ta-da! Great. Here. At no cost to you. VHicks.com. Roadmap to the automotive world. You have to get inside the car to really know NASCAR. And you can get that ultimate inside access with NASCAR in-car. For every NASCAR Nextel Cup Series points race, you'll see what we see, hear what we hear. Switch between seven drivers on seven in-car camera channels. There's no other way to get this much in-car access. Unless, of course, you're me. Call now to order and you can get a free Winston Cup 2003 Year in Review DVD. Visit GoInCar.com for details. NASCAR in-car. Only available on digital cable. Order it today. Would you like to lower your mortgage payments up to 45%? I could reduce my monthly payment? Tell me how. Introducing Smart Choice, the new home loan exclusively from Quicken Loans. Whether you're buying a new home or refinancing, Smart Choice is the answer. Here's an example. A traditional 30-year loan for $200,000 at 6% interest would be $1,200 a month. But with Smart Choice, that same loan would be an amazingly low $550 a month. That's a difference of $7,800 a year. That's good news. So what are we waiting for? Call 888-54-QUICK right now and see how you can lower your monthly mortgage payments. The new Smart Choice loan can lower your monthly payments up to 45%. It's great for refinancing or making that new home more affordable. Gives you monthly payment flexibility so you can decide to pay just interest or add principal and pay off your home even faster. Plus, with Smart Choice, you'll have extra money each month to remodel your home, pay off credit cards, or whatever you need. It's your choice with Smart Choice. Call 888-54-QUICK right now while rates are still low and see how you can lower your monthly payments up to 45% and have more money on hand every month. Reducing my monthly payments would be great. See how much Smart Choice can lower your payments, no matter what your loan amount. Take a look. The difference can be up to $5,000, $7,000, even $19,000 a year. Smart Choice, the new home loan exclusively from Quicken Loans, can work for you, even if you just refinanced. We got all our home loans from Quicken Loans. We'd never go anywhere else. So if you're refinancing or if you're buying a new home, call 888-54-QUICK now. Or go to quickenloans.com and lower your mortgage payments by up to 45%. But don't wait. Take advantage today before rates go up. Tonight, has a 14-year-old boy been wrongly accused? Find out on the interrogation of Michael Crow at 8. Then it's Forensic Files at 9 and the Hog Trail Murders at 10. We're back at Georgia v. Turner. The jury has been sent out just recently while the attorneys were arguing about the testimony of Jeff Mack. He wanted to testify that he had been hit on by the defendant. 
um, the judge has disallowed this and we're going to go back to live testimony in the courtroom. He, he's on the stand. Would you advise him not to get into that area and then I'll bring in the jury when you're ready? I can, if I could just tell him when he comes by, Judge. Yes, sir. You, you may. And Mr. Bates, you may bring in the jury, please. <coughs> While the jury is re-entering, let's take a look at what Jeff was saying earlier that he wanted to bring into testimony. Mr. Mack, if you would go ahead and tell us about the event that you said you had your shirt off. Yes, sir. Uh, Lynn was complimenting me on my uh, muscles and how tan I was. Uh, I felt it was way out of line. I think every gentleman in this room knows when a woman's coming on to him, and that's exactly how I felt. The way she was walking around me and looking at me and speaking to me. She then asked me to go to Florida with her and her uh, girlfriends uh, for the weekend. It was a girl's trip. I declined. I thought it was highly inappropriate. Uh, concerned Glenn, Glenn been my heart of hearts as a brother to me and uh, made me feel very uncomfortable. And now we're going to go back to live testimony in Georgia v. Turner. Did you have occasion to attend? Yes, sir, I did. their marriage, did you ever have occasion to go over to their home? Yes, sir. Did you notice anything remarkable when you were there in the home? Yes, sir. I saw that uh, there was a bed made on the couch. Um, and Glenn had told me that already previously that uh, he and Lynn did not sleep in the same bedroom. Uh, we talked about it frequently. I asked him why. He told me she had female problems, uh, wasn't able to have uh, sexual intercourse with him. and. Uh, we both respected that, but uh, it didn't make sense why they couldn't sleep in the same bed together. Was Lynn, the defendant, there when you were over there? Yes, sir. She, she had actually called me over to the house. Can you tell us about that conversation? Yes, sir. It was uh, I, just one evening. Uh, got a telephone call. Lynn said Glenn was in the shower. Uh, he'd asked her to call me to come over um, to watch a game or just hang out. Uh, I obliged and jumped in my car, went over. Um, when I got there, Glenn uh, was, to his surprise, I was there. It was apparent he had no idea I was coming over. Uh, as soon as I got there, Lynn said she was leaving. Uh, Glenn said, well, hey, Jeff just got here. Let's just hang out or we'll all go with you. And uh, she said, she just, she actually just kind of snapped. She turned, she said, uh, no, forget it. She got uh, real loud and angry, uh, started yelling at him, said, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, they proceeded to get in an argument. Uh, he kept asking her, uh, well, honey, where are you going? What's the big deal? Why can't we go with you? Um, she proceeded to get angrier and angrier. She ended up uh, throwing her keys across the room on the counter, stormed into the bedroom, slammed the door. I looked at Glenn and said, Oh my God, I, I think I better leave, Glenn. Uh, I think I called him Buddha, that's what I usually called him. So did you leave? Yes, sir. <clears throat> the other times that you would visit with him or he'd come by the house, did you ever see him on the weekend? Was Lynn ever with him on the weekend? No, sir. Did she ever give you any explanation as to where she was on the weekend? Yes, sir. Uh, frequently when I detailed her car, she would uh, talk uh, considerable about uh, she was a undercover narcotics agent up in Tennessee and that's why uh, she was never around on the weekend. She used, she'd usually leave on a Friday afternoon and return either Sunday or sometime Monday. Did Glenn ever talk to you about his financial problems? Well, it just uh, we, we discussed uh, you know, things were tight and he was trying to pay off. I didn't know any numbers, so to speak, but uh, I knew he had some credit card debt he was trying to pay off. Uh, if he wasn't working at the department, he sure as would, uh, you know, look for a part-time job somewhere where he could uh, make some extra money to uh, get uh, back on his feet or out of, the, out of the red, so to speak. I can't actually recall a day he didn't work. 
Do you recall where uh, where he worked? Yes, he'd uh, he'd work a part-time job down at uh, the uh, theater from time to time doing security. Um, he'd also work at uh, Lim had a job at uh, Chevron off uh, Russell Road, just uh, uh, was that outside the perimeter, um, and he would fill in from her frequently and. Uh, I'd go down and visit with him when he was working at that gas station. It was really, he was like uh, just a little cubicle that he'd sit in and people would come up and pay for their gas. And, you know, all this was before you could pull up to the pump and throw your credit card at the machine and pay for it. So that's what his duties were there. that you spent with him, do you have an opinion as to his mental status regarding suicidal thoughts or anything? Sure. I mean, naturally, if, you know, your marriage is failing and you've come to terms that it's not going to work, which we discussed, um, you know, he's distraught over that. Um, but uh, as far as suicide, uh, that's ludicrous. I mean, he was making plans and steps to... Uh, finalize his marriage and move out and get on with his life. Like I said, he was a happy-go-lucky kind of guy, like a big teddy bear. Always had a big smile on his face and was always looking for a, the brighter side on things. He was a man that knew what he wanted in life and he was going to do it. How did you learn of uh, Glenn Ted? Uh, Mike Archer telephoned me one Friday evening and uh, told me he was dead. Did you have occasion to attend either the viewing or the funeral or both? Both. Did you notice anything that you thought was unusual at the viewing? Yes, sir. Yeah. When I was at the viewing, um, Lynn was just standing in the back corner of, uh, I can't really describe to you how the Patterson's funeral home was laid out, but she was just kind of stuck in the back corner um, with uh, Paul Rushing, and I don't know who else she was with. Um, I'd never seen any of them before. Um, I walked up to her, gave her my condolences, and uh, she seemed uh, more irritable and angry more than anything that uh, everybody was there, and you know, it was just uh, she looked very uncomfortable and didn't uh, she didn't intertwine with any of the. Glenn's family members or any of us, I was shocked. I mean, she had nothing to say to anybody. And this was her husband. It was almost like uh, she had somewhere else she'd rather be. Did you also see her at the funeral? Yes, sir. Did you notice anything remarkable at the funeral? Yes, sir. The last time I saw Lynn Turner was uh, at the funeral. I remember her as soon as she received the flag, um, as they do when an officer passes. Um, the widow gets a flag. Um, she was handed the flag. I remember her taking the flag, uh, grabbing Paul Rushing's arm and saying, I can't take this shit. Let's get the hell out of here. And when she said that, um, I'd like to uh, say that uh, it wasn't a, an emotional, this is too much, I can't handle it. It was almost like, really, let's just get the hell out of here. <laughs> We're going to go back to more live testimony from Georgia, but first, here's a news break from Annika Pergament. Hello again, I'm Annika Pergament with the latest from the Court TV News Center. This is the first picture of Thomas Hamill since he escaped from his captors in Iraq over the weekend. Hamill has been flown to a U.S. base in Germany and will soon be reunited with his family today. The 43-year-old truck driver fled the house where he was being held and ran to American soldiers patrolling the area. Hamill is suffering from an infected gunshot wound to his right arm, but otherwise is listed in good condition. A top aide to Osama bin Laden is being sentenced today in New York. Mamdou Mahmoud Salim is being sentenced today for stabbing a federal prison guard in the eye, causing brain damage. He faces up to 21 years for the attack. Salim still faces trial on conspiracy charges for the embassy bombing in East Africa in 1998. 
Turkish police have detained 16 suspected Islamic militants in connection with an alleged plot to bomb the NATO summit in Istanbul next month. Police confiscated weapons and bomb-making materials in a raid, along with as many as 4,000 CDs documenting the plot. The NATO summit is to be attended by many world leaders, including George Bush. A California man who had his child molestation convictions thrown out after 20 years in prison will appear in court tomorrow for a hearing to determine his release date. John Stoll was convicted on 17 counts of child molestation back in 1985. A judge found investigators on the case coerced confessions from the alleged victims who were six to eight years old. Hollywood studios and screenwriters will continue negotiations over a contract dispute. The main issue at hand is DVD profits. The writers union says studios are making more than $10 per sale while writers receive only five cents. The old contract expired on Sunday, but both sides agreed to continue negotiations Wednesday. California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger is trying to stop two Ohio brothers from making and selling bobblehead dolls in his likeness. A thousand of the dolls are produced in part for charity and feature the governor in a suit with an ammo belt and machine gun. Schwarzenegger's lawyers say they want production of the dolls stopped and for a substantial payment to be made to him. And that is the latest from the Court TV News Center. I'm Monica Pergament. Open Court with Sloan Lindemann will return after the break. How does one of the greatest stars of all time spend the night out? Not yet, Richard, not yet, without. With a few hundred of his closest friends. Who wouldn't want to lock lips with that? He is a good kid. As soon as he come out this ballroom, I'm going to hit his ass. Saturday, join Denzel Washington, Sharon Stone, Queen Latifah, Winona Ryder, Liam Neeson, Diane Lane, Laura Linney, Louis Gossett Jr., Gary Marshall, and many more. For an all-star tribute to Richard Gere, Saturday at 10. Wow, this turned out so much better than I feared. Only on USA Network. We're back live in the trial of Georgia v. Turner. Jeff Mack on the stand, friend of Glenn Turner, who's just testified that right before his, his death, that he testified that, that his marriage was practically over. Let's take a listen. As they please, when they please, whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. Chicken noodle soup. Uh, <coughs> favorite drink was sweet tea. He loved, uh, you know, country style foods. Spaghetti was one of his favorites. My mom's spaghetti. But we, we used to call him Fat Boy too. It was just kind of a nickname. But he'd eat anything. He, it was, you know. During Christmas, he'd, he'd go from house to house eating Christmas meals. We didn't know how he did it, but he did it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mack. Please forgive me, Mr. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Head. I'll call Mr. Reynolds at this time. to you uh, 
concerning uh, any change of insurance or increase in insurance or anything of this nature we'd be concerned in this relationship with that. No, sir. Okay. And uh, you indicate that upon learning of Glenn's passing away that uh, Mark Archer is the one who told you. Correct. Okay. Pretty good. Were you pretty good friends with yes, sir. Sergeant Archer at that time? Yes, I was. Let's talk a little bit about your relationship with both Glenn and, and Lynn Turner. You indicate to us that uh, uh, you actually met Lynn through Glenn. Yes, sir. All right. And I believe your statement tells us that uh, they would come over together to your parents' home and both of them would have dinner with you and your family. That was rare, but uh, it was nine times out of ten, it was just Glenn. Lynn would come occasionally. All right. Did she come, son? Yes. All right. But you were obviously much closer to Glenn. Yes, sir. Both you and your family. Correct. Right. Now, you talk a little bit about um, the search situation about Dad and what their, she and uh, Glenn may have been going through. Uh, he liked to spend money, too. Fair statement? No, sir. Okay, did he have uh, a relatively new truck when you knew him? I guess it was relatively new. Okay. Did he have a motorcycle when you knew? At one time he did have a motorcycle. Okay. Did he later get rid of the truck and get a new Camaro when you knew? Yes, sir, he did. Okay. And this is while he was working as a police officer, obviously. Correct. Along with these extra jobs you told us about. What do you mean, the extra jobs? He was doing the extra jobs also. Correct. And as your <coughs> knowledge of the police officers and your relationship with them, that's not unusual. Most officers work part-time jobs, don't they? Most. Okay. Now, are you aware of the fact of any extra <coughs> jobs that Liam may have had here this time period? Just the one at the Chevron. Okay, so you're not aware if, for example, she was working additional hours in the morning at a law firm. Well, I also knew of, uh, what she had told me about her being an undercover agent in Tennessee. All right. Okay, let me ask you again. Are you aware of the time period she was working with a law firm in the morning hours? Uh, no, sir. Okay, so you didn't know about that? No, sir. All right. Now, this situation about this undercover work up in Tennessee, uh, do you know categorically whether or not she was doing that? I do not. Okay. But she told you she was? Yes, sir. Now these gifts you tell the lady gentleman of the jury about, you indicate that Lynn bought or purchased Glenn some gifts when they were dating. Correct. Oh. And he would show you the gifts that she had purchased him while they were dating. Correct. Oh. Let's talk a little bit about you, what you ended up with about seeing Glenn uh, and him sharing with you a little bit about his uh, uh, relationship with Lynn. You indicated that he told you that the marriage wasn't working out and that, in fact, he was considering moving out. Correct? Actually, that's not a fair statement. Okay, I apologize. Did he say he was asking or considering to ask his parents to move into their home for a period of time? It, may I clarify, Judge? You can well, just yes, respond sir. to my question. You can I want you to explain it. Oh, hold on, please. He, he, I, I, sir, I want you to, to answer, his qu answer the question in uh, the most accurate way possible. Okay, could we start over? With sure, the I apologize. I'll see if I can make it a little clearer. Sure. Did he indicate to you during your meeting with him, I believe it was at McDonald's, right. that he was considering asking your parents if he could move into their basement? He, was, he did. He did do that? Yes, sir. Okay. Did he indicate to you that instead of your parents' place, I'm going to move in with my father? He said that was a possibility. Uh, now, did he physically go ask your mom and dad to move into the basement? Yes, sir, he did. All right. And were you there when that happened? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you indicated in your statement that during that conversation is when Glenn initially told you he was sick and had not been feeling well for the last few days. At my parents' house. Okay. Is that, is that, I'm not answering, I'm asking. Now you help me. I mean, I gathered the reading from McDonald's. Are you telling me that's not where it was? Well, he, he didn't feel well there either. Okay, all right, so let's talk about that. So at McDonald's, he's indicated to you that he doesn't feel well. Right. Did he indicate to you, as according to your statement, that it's been for the last few days he hasn't been feeling well? I 
in a sickly way or an emotional one? Sick. I'd say, in general, he didn't feel well uh, health-wise or uh, emotionally. Oh, so when your statement tells me that he told me he was sick, and this is two weeks before him passing away, then I want to just make sure we're under, we're clear about the time frame. Okay. About two weeks or so before he passes away, he tells you he doesn't feel well. Two weeks before, they said he didn't feel well. I think that was uh, more uh, emotionally with his marriage. So when you indicate to us that he told me he was sick, do you mean physically? Yes, sir. He, he felt sick. All right. Now, he, you also he, he was unable to eat. He didn't feel well that day at McDonald's. Didn't you say you have another conversation with him about a week before he passes away? Correct. All right. And you indicated in your statement that he was still sick. What statement is this? Can I the one you gave to the agent Kim on February 14th. I think he's entitled, since he's actually crossing him on it, if he could show him the statements if he's going to ask him. Sure. Dr. Morton, have you been Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We had you two sheets of that statement. The first one just said the top, so you'll understand the date I'm referring to. Do you recall speaking to agent Kim? Was this a phone interview? I wasn't there, Mac. I don't know. It's a gentleman sitting right here behind Ms. Head, Ms. Mallory, the DBI agent, Agent Key. Correct. You recall speaking to him? Yes, sir. Okay, did you do that on the phone or physically? Physically. All right. Now, let me ask you to flip over to the next page. Sure. February 14th, 2002. Mm -hmm. Little time passed between February 14th, 2002 and today, correct? Yes, sir. And even more time passed between the time this incident happened that you testified to and you spoke to Agent King, because we're going all the way back to 1995, aren't we, Mr. Mack? Yes, sir. All right. Do you have a review? He went into the jungle and came out with a lie worth its weight in gold. The largest gold deposit in the world. See how the fool scientists sparked a Wall Street frenzy. Investors looked at the rising stock price and said, this must be real. And made billions from a gold mine that didn't exist. The biggest fraud of all time. But can he pull off the world's greatest disappearing act? He jumped out of the helicopter. An all-new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. The number one selling diet pill in America. It's Xantrex 3. Rapid weight loss, incredible energy, and one amazing super pill. Xantrex 3. Yes! 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 Xantrex 3 at GNC and Sparta retailers nationwide. Yes! The most powerful diet pill in America. Xantrex 3. More weight loss, faster weight loss, energy to burn. Xantrex 3. Yes! 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 Xantrex 3 at Sparta retailers nationwide. No wonder everyone loves Xantrex 3. Xantrex 3. Yes! If you're the parent of a college or college-bound student, I've got some great news for you. So grab a pen and write this down. It's called the Parent Loan, and it's the smartest way to finance your child's college education, even if paying for college isn't a major financial concern to you. You simply can't afford not to take advantage of this incredible federally insured loan. Uh, here's how it works. Interest rates are as low as 2.2%. That's right, 2.2%. You can finance the entire cost of your child's educational expenses. It's available for any college or university. And it's not income-based, so regardless of income or assets, you can qualify. Think about it. With rates as low as 2.2%, you could place the money you are going to use for college into investments that may earn far more interest. So call now and take advantage of the parent loan. The education finance experts at Student Loan Express make it easy. 
You can apply by phone or online and get pre-approved in just seconds. Don't miss this opportunity. Call today. How much are you paying for internet service? $21? $23? Aren't you being charged too much? We think so. With People PC Online, you get unlimited internet access for only $10.95 a month. Go to peoplepc.com now to try us free for 30 days and compare us with your current ISP. With People PC Online, you get internet service for less than half of what the big guys cost. And that's just the beginning. You also get more local access numbers than AOL, plus a smart dialer that automatically chooses the fastest, most reliable number. So you always get the best connection. All for just $10.95 a month. Try People PC Online free for 30 days and see for yourself. Go to peoplepc.com for a quick three-minute download of our easy-to-use software. Or call 1-800-748-3086. People PC Online, a better way to internet. Wednesday on an all-new Forensic Files. It's the toughest test yet for DNA experts. It's very difficult sometimes. So they sent this tissue to a girl pathologist. When a popular high school teacher is reported missing. There's absolutely no way my father would have just up and leave. Can studying the family tree help forensic investigators crack the case? You want to make damn sure that this is the right guy? Find out on an all-new Forensic Files. Wednesday at 9, right here on Court TV. After a very effective cross-examination, right, let's go to the redirect yeah. of Jeff yeah. Mack. A lot more convenient to just move in with my mom and dad until he could find a place around town somewhere there that uh, he could move into. All right, thanks. And you didn't indicate in your statements to Agent King or investigator Bro about the total possibility of his father, did you? I, like I said, I, I mean, the statement, I, the deposition I had with uh, Mr. King, I hadn't seen that until today since uh, I spoke with him. I've never seen a copy of that. So you don't recall exactly what you told Agent King on February the 14th, 2002? I'd have to read over my statement to recall it. <coughs> That's all I have to say. May I be excused, John? No objection, John. Mr. Mack, you're going to be excused from your subpoena, which means the, that you're not subject to uh, coming back here to this trial, or you're not subject to being brought back by either the state or the defense. You may stay in the courtroom if you'd like, you may leave. The only rule that still remains is you may not talk about your testimony with any other possible witness in this case. <coughs> if you know someone is not a witness, you know absolutely someone is not a witness, then you may talk to them if you choose to do so. Thank you, Mr. Mack. You're excused. A good start for Jeff Mack, but perhaps I think the defense managed to turn it around. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, this was really classic cross-examination. You didn't hear any rancor. Uh, but what you did see in a very affable style, um, classic cross-examination, slicing away at the, at the witness. And at with the end, such a calm, cool demeanor. I mean, I thought Vic Reynolds came off as a professional with a capital P. And w w when an attorney, after every answer, looks at that jury and goes, okay, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you begin to feel, well, I guess that must be coming in good for the defense, and it is because what you end up with is a potentially interested witness with little to say. Okay, keep that thought. We're going to go back live. And what it is your occupation? My name is Corporal David Dunkerton, D-U-N-K-E-R-T-O-N. I'm assigned to Ranger Services, Cobb County Police Department. And how long have you been employed by the Cobb County Police Department? Since March of 1988. How long have you been assigned to the Ranger Services? Uh, almost a year. What exactly is that? We're responsible for park services. Um, we have 53 parks in the county. We respond to all calls for service at those locations and assist the precincts with uh, all their calls as a backup units. Prior to this assignment, what was your duty? I was assigned to the patrol division in the 5th precinct prior to going to Ranger Services. Uh, prior to that, I was assigned to Special Operations Motorcycle Unit. And prior to that, I was worked in the precincts as a motor unit before I started in patrol when I initially joined the department. All right. 
And prior to your working for Cobb County, do you have any other law enforcement experience? Yes, almost six years in the Air Force, stationed at Keesler Air Force Base. Yeah. Being here, are you familiar with Roswell's Air Force Base by any chance? Yes. My family moved here in the early 70s. My father was working for Burroughs Computer Company there at Robbins Air Force Base. I graduated from high school in Warner Robbins in 1982. Did you go to the Air Force right out of high school? Right out of high school. Now, in your duties with the Cobb County Police Department, uh, did you become familiar with a gentleman by the name of Glenn Turner? Yes, I did. Tell us how you came to know Glenn. Uh, he was working at the 4th Precinct. Um, I completed my training and was assigned to the 4th Precinct. Um, and we worked a shift together there and then eventually attended a motor school um, and were assigned to the motor units. At that time, they were assigned to the precincts before they were moved to special operations. Uh, and we were riding partners. Did y'all attend the motor school together? Did yes, we did. You say that? When was it that you came to the police department? When did I come to the yes, police department? In March of 88. Is that when you would have met Glenn in, in that time frame? In that time frame. All right. And with regards to your moving, initially when you came on to the department, were you, your first assignment was that to motorcycles? No, I was originally assigned to uh, work a shift at the precinct, <coughs> regular patrol duties. And was Glenn doing those same types of duties at that time? Yes. Did y'all both leave at the same time to go work on motors? We didn't actually leave. We were just reassigned at, to those duties at the precinct. Okay. I think you said y'all actually rode as partners. Is that correct? Yes. Um, it's been mentioned of the... TV show Chips. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Was that somewhat how y'all rode together as partners like that show? On our particular shift, we had two motors assigned, and our shift lieutenant, his rule was that we would ride together. If both of us were working, we would ride together, and we would patrol together, those type of things. So we, I guess you would probably, if somebody saw us, they might think that. Okay, fair enough. Um, in this role as partners in motorcycles, was there any sort of particular uh, concern y'all had for one another or ways that y'all dealt with one another as partners? We watched out for each other constantly. Being on motorcycles, you know, you're not observed as easily by the motoring public, so we, you, know, you kind of watched out for each other, you know, for road hazards. Um, being part of the motor squad, as it, as it was called, uh, was something unique. It was unique to me and it was actually it's unique to the department and most actually Metro Atlanta uh, departments when we all get together for different dignitary details and funerals and things. It's all the motors kind of are off to one side while everybody else is doing their thing. It's a that's a whole different breed. All right. And did y'all grow close to one another both professionally and personally? As yes. Well? You had a lot of time a lot of downtime so you had a lot of time that you were able to sit around and just talk with each other when we were out on a traffic enforcement detail or um, we may be sitting watching a stop sign in a particular neighborhood for a traffic complaint or something like that. So you, you couldn't just sit there and, not, and stare at each other. You, so it was natural that you'd strike up conversations and, and talk about different things. All right. How, how much time did y'all spend together working together? Well, we worked eight hour shifts, five days a week. So unless one of us was off or gone to some sort of training, for the most part, it's 40 hours a week. All right. And in the process of this working together and conversing with one another, uh, did y'all share things with one another about yes. your personal life? Yes, we did. We, we talked about, you know, where we wanted to go in the department. We talked about uh, people in general in the department. We talked about where our relationships, you know, our personal relationships were, you know, with spouse, girlfriends, those kind of things. And, um, so we just, I guess... It's really hard. It's just, it's just conversation. You know, you just talk about everything. I mean, it wasn't anything in particular that you talked about every day. It was you just, you know, it's like riding around with your brother. Okay. Uh, so was this someone that you confided in on a regular basis? Yeah. Yes. And did he confide in you as well? Yes. Someone that you trusted with your conversations about things? Trusted him with the conversation. Trusted him with my life. All right. Fair enough. Um, outside of the working for the police department. Did you have any other sort of part-time jobs that Glenn was involved with? I worked uh, different part-time jobs. There would be different security jobs that would come up like at movie theaters, things like that. Some of the part-time jobs would be several officers would work the same detail yeah. at different times.
You know, it needs to be noted that these are extraordinary legal teams. Neil, you and I have been saying it's really impressive. I mean, amazing lawyers, an incredible judge who's really terribly experienced, and I had a great guest today. So I thank you so much, Neil Getnick, former prosecutor, for being here. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here, and it's good that you made that point. That people can really appreciate our justice system. Thanks a lot. Well, that's all the time we have today on Open Court. Stay tuned for more live testimony in Trial Heat with James Curtis and Lisa Bloom. I'm Sloan Lindeman. Fred Graham will be back here tomorrow morning at 9 to begin the courtroom day with you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning on Open Court, and have a great day. Wednesday, on all new Masterminds, he went into the jungle and came out with a lie worth its weight in gold. It's the largest gold deposit in the world. See how he fooled scientists, sparked the Wall Street frenzy. Investors looked at the rising stock price and said, this must be real. And made billions from a gold mine that didn't exist. The biggest fraud of all time. But can he pull off the world's greatest disappearing act? He jumped out of the helicopter. In all new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. OxyClean Active Stain Remover tackles over 101 stains. Use it in your laundry room for a ring around the collar. Your clothes will look better and last longer. For tough setting stains like grass, use OxyClean Active Stain Remover. It starts working the minute you spray it on. This ready-to-use formula is perfect for those creative messes. It'll take pet stains and odors out of your carpet. Look for OxyClean Active Stain Remover online or in retail stores everywhere. Garden Claw, one of America's favorite garden tools, is good as gold. It adjusts to fit gardeners of all sizes. Garden Claw Gold helps you cultivate, loosen, aerate, and weed without being tough on your back. The Claw's steel tines tear through all kinds of soil, even clay, bringing moisture and oxygen to plants' roots. And it turns weeds and leaves into beneficial mulch. Garden Claw Gold makes a great gift. At Home Depot, Kmart, Menards, Lowe's, and participating Ace True Value and Do It Best Hardware. Not acceptable to live in pain today. For most, it can be a simple pain that starts in the lower back and hips. The pain can be a dull, constant ache with weakness in the joints and muscle spasms, or at times it can be a sharp, burning sensation. Untreated, the pain spreads down the sciatic nerve to the thighs, knees, even the feet and ankles. If you suffer from any of these symptoms, call the leaders in pain management, Arrowhead Clinics. They've been winning the war on pain for over 25 years. Call Arrowhead Clinics now, because when you're in pain, we want to help. Relief, recovery, and results are just a phone call away. Call today, pain goes away. It's worth the drive. That fruit stand way down Taylor's Road. The sun warmed, fresh from the field, at half what they cost in the store. Value. People who know where to find it, find it on Uniroyal tires. Like the Laredo Cross Country. High quality, hard working, and best of all, affordable. Uniroyal. For everything you value. Find us at Big Ten Tires. I get great value with high-speed internet and cable. That's why I choose Adelphia. PowerLink makes everything on the internet faster. Well, the internet service is simply faster. You have to see it to believe it. I know cable is the better technology, and Adelphia leads the way with high-speed internet and all that new stuff. The interactive program, guys, I can't live without. I get cable and internet from Adelphia, and I save. I was on the internet. Then I got PowerLink. It's awesome. Adelphia is a leader in technology. They're clearly the best. I can count on Adelphia. Huge savings, huge selection, superior service, the Big J, the Justin Dodge Chrysler Jeep way. We don't just sell you a car. We provide you the ultimate service experience after the sale. At Justin Dodge, with any car you buy, new or used, you get from $1,500 to $3,000 worth of service savings with the Justin Rewards Loyalty Program. And for every dollar you save in service, you get a dollar-for-dollar dollar match towards your next purchase at any Justin Auto Group location. Only at the Big J, Justin Dodge Chrysler Jeep. Has a 14-year-old boy been wrongly accused? Find out on the interrogation of Michael Crow at 8. Then it's Forensic Files at 9 and the Hog Trail Murders at 10. Welcome to Trial Heat for this Monday, May 3rd. I'm Lisa Bloom. And I'm James Curtis. We're in a brand new trial, Georgia versus Turner. We're going to bring you up to date on all the details. Meanwhile, there is live testimony in that Georgia courtroom. David Dunkerton, a corporal with the Cobb County Police Department, is on the stand. And, you know, let me be maybe more specific. 
I'm sorry. Let me be a little more specific. Okay. Did you ever speak with Glenn regarding sleeping arrangements of their marriage? Through the conversations he had, you know. Judge, I don't want to object at this point for the record again uh, into those areas. There may be a, another area that comes up that we'll need to have a hearing on, but we'll wait until we get there. All right. And, and Mr. Lumpkin and Mr. Berry will know pursuant to earlier rulings whether we need to have a hearing. But as to this objection, <coughs> As to this area, over, overruled. He will continue, Corporal. He, he had advised me that um, at that particular time that they had actually only slept together twice since they had been married, and that he was sleeping on the couch at his home. When you say at that particular time, this before or after their marriage? This was after. Okay. Any idea of how long into the marriage that was? I I couldn't recall. He said that he was sleeping on the couch or she was sleeping on the couch? He was. Ever talk about what his feelings for Lynn was despite these problems? Uh, he told me that he loved her very much. That um, through the conversations, you know, it was like, I, I would question, you know, why, why do you stay if it's like that, you know, kind of thing. It was, you know, it, his response to me was, when you get married, that's the way it's supposed to be, and you, and you work through these things. Um, and I looked up to him for that. I mean, he, he just, you know, to me, that was, showed me just what kind of character he had. And were you suggesting to him that if you were in that situation, things would be different? I told him I don't know that I could handle it that way. Did Glenn ever relate to you uh, anything with, regard, with regards to Lynn's going off on weekends? I know that there were times when um, he would say things about at the last minute, um, he would find out that Lynn was going to go to Florida or go somewhere you know, for, for a couple of days. And it irritated him because sometimes he didn't know far enough in advance that he could actually get the annual leave you know, to be able to, to go. Or if he got it, uh, there were occasions when, you know, he said, well, I'm going to take off the next couple of days and go. And then later on in the shift, after he talked to her on the phone or go up to dispatch and talk to her or whatever, he'd tell me, you know, I'm not going. I'm just, I'll be here tomorrow. Um, that she either canceled it or told him she didn't want him to go with her, that she was going with her girlfriend. Okay. Recalling how many occasions that would have happened? No, it, like I said, it's been so many years ago, I wouldn't be able to put you a number on it. But at least I want to catch At least. to uh, the financial situation here in the marriage. Did Glenn ever discuss that with you? He just told me he worked a lot. <laughs> the way he put it, he worked a lot, she spent a lot. Were you aware of any other work he was doing outside the police department? Like I said, I knew he was working different part-time jobs, and at one point, you know, he reluctantly told me that he was working um, a part-time job that he said the department wasn't aware of. He was working at a service station. Okay. Any reason why he would have been reluctant about sharing that? There's no way. It wasn't in the county. Okay. There's nothing unusual about officers working part-time jobs, though. Something no. Okay. Were you familiar with the vehicle that he drove, other than his motorcycle? He had a, a burgundy truck, um, Chevrolet truck, and then at one point that truck was um, traded in and, and a Camaro was was purchased. And did he drive that Camaro around? He, he would drive it occasionally. Um, he told me he actually, they, they got the Camaro, Lynn wanted a Camaro. He wasn't driving the truck as much as he, you know, would normally, since he had a take home motorcycle, we took our motorcycles home. So, you know, when you left to go to work, you just got on your bike and you were in service. It wasn't one of those drive to work, you know, that kind of thing. So he wasn't doing much with it. Um, and that's what she wanted, and he was trying to, to please her. Because at the same time, it was like, "You're working all this. Why are you going to get a? Why are you going to buy the Camaro? Kind of thing." And you know, he said, "That's what she wants." And you know, you know, I'm trying to do what to, whatever I have to do to make her happy. Now, did she have a car of her own at that time that you're aware of? She 
I think she did at that time. I, there was, um, I think it was a, a, some sort of pace car or something like that. I don't remember. And the, this Camaro that you're talking about is Lynn bought. Do you recall what it looked like? Um, it was a burgundy one, and I believe it was a convertible. I can write the witness room. You may. Let me show you what's from Martin State 7 and 8, the photographs. There's a car depicted in those photographs. Do you recognize that vehicle? Yes, this was, um, as, as Glenn explained it to me, this was Lynn's car, yes. Okay. Is this a different car than the one you're talking about, Glenn having purchased after the marriage? Yes. But it's nevertheless a Camaro, but the car for Camaro, in other words. Yes. And Glenn indicated to you why? Did they buy a second Camaro? He said that that was the car that Lynn wanted and he didn't see any reason not to since he wasn't driving his truck and he was like I said he said he was trying to just make her happy. Yeah, I'll get a approach, please, sir. Yes, you can. witness, David Dunkerton, was a, was a co-worker of the victim in this case, Glenn Turner, Lisa Bloom. This is one of several witnesses that this jury has heard from this morning who talks about the foibles of this defendant. Her name is Lynn Turner. She was married to this man, Glenn Turner. He died, thought to be of natural causes. Then, within days, she moves in with a new guy, a boyfriend. He then dies some years later, back in 2001. She is on trial not for the 2001 death of the boyfriend, but for the prior death of the husband. Well, foibles is about the nicest word you could put on. I think like the prosecution that? would yeah. say she's evil, she's greedy on their honeymoon. She's asking him to sign over a life insurance policy to her already. Uh, she's cruel to him. She doesn't sleep with him more than twice in the entire marriage. This guy's sleeping out on the couch from the beginning. And this is a situation that prosecutors say was very, very calculated, very, very cold. The proverbial black widow is what she's been oh, called by Oh, I hate that expression, some. James. Well, you know, you may hate it, but certainly that is, it is a term that has been used with respect to Lynn Turner in some of the press accounts You know, accounts all the cases we written, see so. of husbands killing their wives, and there's no comparable term, but a oh, wife absolutely. killing her husband, she's a black widow. Well, you know, and it goes to part of the sexist uh, manifestations in our society. If you think about, I heard this quoted some way, so I'm going to have to look up the study. There are so many more pejorative terms in the American lexicon for women than there yeah, so are of men. Yeah, so let's not be a part so of that. So I'm telling you, I am reporting. This is called reporting. <laughs> this is what she's being called in the press. But let's move on. We are the press. Let's talk about, let's talk about some of the di dynamics in this relationship okay. between these two individuals, lest you castigate me more <laughs> for using the it's term Monday morning. that has been, and I'm it's raining out. You. It's raining out here. It's drizzling. <laughs> We're kind of honored today. Jason Williams is We're done. going to spend a little time in a break so Lisa and I can duke it out behind the scenes. <laughs> then we'll come back and duke it out some more in front of you. We are bringing you a live trial from the great state of Georgia. Georgia versus Lynn Turner. Stay with us. He went into the jungle and came out with a lie worth its weight in gold. The largest gold deposit in the world. See how the fool scientists sparked the Wall Street frenzy. Investors looked at the rising stock price and said, this must be real. And made billions from a gold mine that didn't exist. The biggest fraud of all time. But can he pull off the world's greatest disappearing act? He jumped out of the helicopter. An all-new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. service, you'll feel really good riding with GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. 
Miracle Ear, right now you can get the best we have to offer at your biggest savings ever. Our most advanced digital hearing system is yours with savings of $2,000. That's right, save $2,000. This special offer is available only at Miracle Ear. So visit one of our 1,000 nationwide locations, many in Sears stores, or call toll-free 1-888-504-4411 to find the location nearest you. But hurry, after May 26th, this exclusive offer will be history. I didn't fit. I'm not in a cheerleader skirt or two-piece or step aerobics or nothing but a sports bra. I didn't fit. But now I do. I'm, I'm up here talking to you. Not pulling at my clothes like I used to. And look at my nerves. Now I fit. For 30 minutes, I'm the first one to forget where I am to laugh out loud, to be the woman I once was before I put myself last. Give yourself 30 minutes at Curves, a place where a proven workout and a little support won't just change your body, it'll change your life. These are my Curves. Are you okay with yours? When you're ready, call Curves and discover the power to amaze yourself. Join Curves now with a friend and enjoy our two-for-one offer. Spring is the perfect time to get your house in shape. And there's no better home improvement than adding a security system from ADT. Call now to take advantage of ADT's spring special. You could even save up to 20% off your homeowner's insurance. And you may qualify for zero down financing for installation. It's ADT's best deal of the year. ADT helps keep more people safe in more ways than any other security company in America. A single ADT system can help protect your home and family from burglary, fire, and carbon monoxide, particularly now when you may be going on vacation and leaving your home empty. And you'll be connected to our customer monitoring center, where ADT professionals are watching out for you around the clock. Call now to order ADT Spring Special and save up to 20% off your homeowner's insurance. But this deal won't last, so you better hurry. Let ADT help make this the safest spring ever. ADT, always there. Wednesday, Ken forensic investigators use a family tree to track down a killer. So they sent this tissue to the pathologist. Find out on an all-new Forensic Files, Wednesday at 9, right here on Court TV. Two men in the history of the state of Georgia have died from antifreeze poisoning. Both of them were in love with Lynn Turner at different times. She's now on trial for the murder of her husband back in 1995, but the state says she also killed her boyfriend years later using the same method. We're bringing you that trial live. The court is now on its morning coffee break, and while it does that, let's get caught up with this background report from Savannah Guthrie. I would like to see whoever murdered my brother brought to justice because I do feel like it, he was murdered. Georgia police officer Glenn Turner found dead in his bed after having flu-like symptoms. The medical examiner ruled that Turner died from natural heart-related causes and the 31-year-old officer was laid to rest without any further investigation. Turner's widow, Lynn, eventually became engaged to firefighter Randy Thompson. Then, six years after the death of her husband, tragedy seemingly struck Lynn Turner's life again. Thompson, her fiancé, and father of her two children, was found dead as well. His death also ruled natural. Family members, though, were suspicious. The exact same way, connected to the exact same person. Um, you can't have two accidents. The families alerted authorities to the connection between the men, Lynn Turner. Investigators found that Turner stood to benefit financially from the deaths because she was the beneficiary of life insurance policies of both Turner and Thompson. We're looking uh, into the similarities in both cases, in both deaths, because at this point, it's as though there's a carbon copy. An autopsy revealed signs that Randy Thompson had ingested ethylene glycol, an odorless chemical found in antifreeze. Authorities decided to exhume the body of Glenn Turner to check for the same signs. What I will be doing is performing a, a second autopsy on uh, Mr. Turner tomorrow to 
determine uh, if there was any foul, any foul play at the time. In particular, what we'll be looking for is toxicology samples to see if he was poisoned. We're really all very emotional. The family's just distraught. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, you, you, you bury somebody and usually that's final. But to bring them back up out of the ground. The second autopsy confirmed the suspicions, and Lynn Turner was charged with the murder of her husband. We allege that Ms. Turner caused the death of Glenn Turner by the injection of ethylene alcohol, uh, glycol. If convicted, Turner could face life in prison. Lynn Turner has denied any involvement in the deaths, and defense attorneys have argued that because there is no evidence of similar circumstances, the jury should not hear about the death of Brandy Thompson. How did she do it in Mr. Turner's case? No, no. How did she do it in Mr. Thompson? No, no. How did she do it in Mr. Turner? When did she do it in Mr. Turner? Don't know. When did she do it in Mr. Thompson? Don't know. Where? Don't know. Where? Don't know. But prosecutors say the similarities are obvious. She used her lifestyle, money, with gifts, cruises, and housing to entrap her victims. The murder weapon, ethylene glycol, is so unique, such as to identify the perpetrator as in using the same pistol in two murders. Judge James Bodiford agreed and will let jurors hear about the second man in Lynn Turner's life to die with ethylene glycol in his system. The family and friends of Glenn Turner have now laid him to rest for a second time and are taking their seats in a Houston County courtroom to watch the trial of his alleged killer. It's going to be settled. We're not going to let up. The family will not let up. Live testimony has resumed, but it's outside the presence of the jury. On the stand, David Dunkerton, who was a friend of the victim, Glenn Turner, talking about the relationship between Glenn and Lynn Turner. Let's listen. Today is not exactly what was said earlier in, in a previous hearing from the standpoint of timing, and I think that's important for the court to know. It'd be, be very unusual to allow you to cross. I'll give you, I'll give you a limited amount of cross on uh, the corporal. You, you may do so at this time. Just a couple of things. You recall giving a statement to Detective Broll back October 24th, I think, of 2001? Yes. Uh, do you recall indicating to him that when you first started riding with Glenn, and that would have been September of 92? Yes. That y'all had the conversation about um, him not living past 31? No, that was me having the conversation with him. Okay. Me telling him that for some reason, I, I had always felt that. I had always, for some reason, felt that I wouldn't make it past 31. And he kind of looked at me like I was like, why are you even thinking that? No, that, that conversation was about me. Okay. And it, it all kind of runs together here, and I want to be sure. Uh, in that same conversation, he indicated to you that if anything happens to me, you should look at, at Lynn. Is that that same conversation that you had had with him about you? No, no, that wasn't at the same time. That conversation that I told him about, about me not making it past 31, it was made when we first started riding together and, and we were talking about different things. Um, the conversation about him making a comment to if anything happened to him was after I was transferred to uh, Precinct 3. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now, Corporal, I'll ask you to stand outside the door. Thank you. We'll be calling you back in just a minute. All right, we're going to take a short break. While the court takes its break, we'll be right back. Wednesday, he made billions off a gold mine that didn't exist. One of the biggest frauds in the history of the world. But is he spending his fortune, or is he buried six feet under? An all-new Masterminds, Wednesday at 8, here on Court TV. As much is clear, there will come a time in your life when you have to choose sides. Specifically, right after you make your steak burger, a platter. We had the real milk milkshakes. We had the hot fudge. Looking back, it was so obvious. The sippable sundae. Steak and shake. Add hot fudge to any milkshake for 39 cents. It's okay, I just got a Delphia DVR. Oh. 
Adelphia DVR is here. You'll never miss what's on TV again. Call today. Adelphia DVR. Watch when you want. Didn't you get eggs? They're everywhere. Beautiful widescreen high definition televisions struck down in the prime of their careers by an utter lack of HD programming. With your help, we can put millions of HD TVs back to work. Now you can subscribe to Boom, over a hundred channels of great entertainment with more than 30 channels in stunning high definition. Over three times more HD programming than any other cable or satellite provider. Just the thing to keep those HD TVs pretty busy. And if you call today, you can get all the monthly programming Boom has to offer at an unbelievably low price. Plus, get Boom with absolutely no upfront cost and free installation. So call 1-888-762-BOOM to subscribe today. Fire up your HD TV with 39 HD channels. Call 1-888-762-BOOM or visit boom.com slash free to order now. Want your perfect PC with award-winning service and support? Then you want a Dell. Call or go online now and get this Dimension desktop with an Intel Pentium 4 processor and three years at-home service for just $6.99 after mail-in rebate. This system also includes an all-in-one printer. Plus, get free two-day shipping. For rock-solid 24-7 service and support, you're getting a Dell. This offer ends May 5th, and it's only a click or call away. Easy as Dell. Dell PCs use Intel Pentium 4 processors. Want peace of mind from your PC? Then you want a Dell. Dell PCs receive an A plus for service and reliability. Just call or go online now and get this Dimension desktop with a powerful Intel Pentium 4 processor for the amazing price of $4.99 after mail-in rebate. And right now, get free two-day shipping and a free CD burner. Notebooks start at $7.49. But hurry, these offers end May 5th, and they're only a click or call away. Easy as Dell. Dell PCs use Intel Pentium 4 processors. Tonight, has a 14-year-old boy been wrongly accused? Find out on the interrogation of Michael Crow at 8. Then it's Forensic Files at 9 and the Hog Trail Murders at 10. Welcome back. We are live in the Georgia courtroom where Lynn Turner is standing trial for the murder of her former husband, Judge James Botiford is discussing admissibility of evidence with the attorneys. That really have that's much the whole time purpose, that, yeah. Mr. Berry. That's the whole purpose of bringing stuff in. So, uh, uh, so I, well, I we just don't like stuff you bring in, Judge. That's well. the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I, I think it's a problem, maybe a problem for the DAs too, if they have people that they, they don't know whether they're going to be on the stand at lunchtime or not, and then they've got to get them fed to get back which is much more of a problem for them. Well, but I mean... I'm, 15 minutes is not much. Right, right now, I'm planning on keeping the strict schedule. Twice a week, you're going to have you're going to have longer time on Tuesday and Thursday. If the jurors can eat in 45 minutes and they're satisfied, then that's what our lunch hour is going to be. Uh, we're going to... We're basically... I'm really... May I just be candid? I'm not so worried about myself or you or Mr. Head. I'm worried about the jurors. So... Uh, and I, I want to keep this case moving. That won't be a problem. That won't be a problem because I'm going to tell tomorrow, I'll tell them where the jurors are going to go and then none of us will go to that place. Is, is that what you're saying? Right. No one, no one is going to go, if, when the jurors go out, let's say they went out to Applebee's tomorrow, then none of us are going to be able to go to Applebee's. Right. Thank you, but thank... No, thank you, though, for, for bringing that up, so... All right, let, let's bring back in the jury, and the, the corporal may come back in if he'd like. Welcome back. The idea that uh, James Botifer, the judge, you heard discussing where it's two things. First of all, what is happening with the logistics of this jury? Their lunch plans, at least when we heard him say, nobody can go to that place when the, ju when the juries go. Um, and the second thing is, I'm keeping this 45-minute lunch yeah. schedule, although it was protested by Jim Berry, one of the lead defense attorneys. Yeah, well, lawyers aren't used to having to take 45-minute lunch. That's like quick. to go and have a nice little napkin and a nice table and be served some food. This judge now, is a no-nonsense judge. He keeps a strict schedule and 
We love this judge because he's a vocal supporter of cameras in the courtroom. So, James, this judge can do no wrong as far as I'm concerned. But, Lisa, you know it's not about having the nice napkin and having a little lunch. No, it's not. When you are in trial, and you know this, come on, making fun of our own, because that's what we get to do. We yeah, practice Lawyers law. don't like nice things. Well, it's not about that, but you know as well as I do, they're working over this lunch yes. period. They're working feverishly to prep these witnesses. New information is coming in all the time to figure out exactly how this trial is going to go. Let's go back into James Botterford. He's the judge on the bench. When we break for lunch, your lunches should, should be in your room along with the drinks. You'll tell me if 45 minutes is enough. I don't, the last thing I want is just, you just sitting back there and just wait, waiting for the judge to go. So if 45 minutes is enough, then that's what we're going to do. It's a pretty short lunch hour. Uh, if that's not long enough, then you, you tell me. We want to, uh, as I told the lawyers here, that I'm not so concerned about myself or the lawyers, I'm much more concerned about you. Now on Tuesdays and Thursdays when you go out, it's probably going to be about an hour and a half. But, but I think that's just appropriate. It, you say every other day you, you go out and stretch your legs a, a little bit and they have, uh, I think they're going to rent a few bands so you'll be comfortable enough, you'll be going together. Yes, sir, Mr. Lumpkin. Thank you, Your Honor. Corporal Dunkerton, do you recall having a conversation with Glenn Turner um, within a couple months of his death, more specifically about his marriage and the direction it was headed? Yes. And were you still working at Precinct 4 at that point in time? I had been transferred to Precinct 3. Okay. And uh, when, continued on the motors, but I was just transferred to another precinct. Right. And when was it that you were transferred? Right around January of, of 95. And <clears throat> this conversation you had with Glenn, were y'all sitting down eating together or working together or what? Or both? When I was, when I was transferred, he, he and I would occasionally meet. Uh, where the precincts bordered each other, and we'd sit down and eat, or we'd stop at a convenience store and have a cold drink or something, just to make sure we, you know, stayed in touch and that kind of stuff. Um, but in particular, the conversation uh, that was while we were having uh, a meal, I believe it was at a Kenny Rogers Rotisserie, I believe, on Powers Ferry Road. All right. And what did he relate to you about the nature of the marriage at that point in time? He told me that he that it was over. I mean, he just he didn't see any other way to to uh, correct it, to make it better, to be able to, to salvage it. Um, said that he had suggested counseling, that uh, Lynn didn't want to attend counseling. Um, I had to actually, we had talked about him just separating and moving out, and he didn't want to do that. He felt that that was the first step of, of getting a divorce. And um, in that particular conversation, he just said there was just no way that he could see himself having, you know, being, being able to stay in it any longer. He put up with it as long as he could, I guess. Did he indicate what he was going to do to affect that change? He would have to get a divorce. Okay. This is different than what he had been telling you previously. <coughs> yes. I, he, he had talked before about the fact that, you know, the relationship wasn't getting better, but that he was, you know, continuing to try to work it because that's what he believed was the right thing to do. Did he relate to you if any, what, if anything, had changed to bring about this change in his position? He, he said that it, the relationship got more, that he was more her roommate than her husband, that, um, and even then, the, the relationship continued to be uh, strained and got to the point where um, he just couldn't, he didn't want to deal with that relationship anymore. He, he, there was nothing else he could do to, to affect the change to the positive that he wanted. Um, so he felt like that that was, you know, the answer was that he would have to leave. And then did he say anything to you that you found remarkable regarding their relationship? He had told me that if anything had happened to him, um, that I needed to look at Lynn. Did he give you any specifics about what he was referring to at that point in time? No, and I, I, I didn't question a whole lot about it because, you know, I didn't, I knew Lynn, and I didn't want to believe that, you know, things had gotten to that point that, you know, he was, I mean, he, he was twice her size, it wasn't, you know, I knew that she wasn't going to beat him up, you know, and, and beyond that, 
Um, no, he didn't. He didn't say that she had threatened him or anything like that. But he just he made the comment to, to look at her. We're going to return to that Georgia courtroom in just a moment. For now, let's go on down to the Court TV News Center where one of the greatest names in news, Annika Pergament, is standing by with today's news. And hello again, I'm Monica Pergament with the latest from the Court TV News Center. In efforts to relieve tensions, the U.S. military has begun pulling out of Fallujah after a month-long siege. The Marines are turning over security to Iraqi forces made up mainly of former soldiers from Saddam Hussein's army. Coalition troops and insurgents had been locked in a month-long battle in Fallujah. The violence began when U.S. forces sieged the city following the mutilation of four U.S. contractors. The alleged abuse of Iraqi prisoners at a Baghdad area prison has gotten more U.S. service members in trouble. Six U.S. soldiers had already been facing criminal charges. Now a military source says seven more soldiers have been reprimanded in connection with the case. Meanwhile, the U.S. commander who had been in charge of the Abu Ghraib prison said she did not know the abuse was taking place. A car packed with explosives went off in Pakistan today, killing three people and injuring at least 11 others. The attack occurred near a bus carrying Chinese engineers to a port in Gawadar. Authorities are investigating but are looking at the possibility a remote control bomb was used. Israeli Prime Minister Eric Likud party has rejected a proposal to disengage with Palestinians and pull Jewish settlements from the West Bank. Sharon presented the disengagement plan to his party after receiving President Bush's endorsement in April. The Prime Minister had hinted before Sunday's referendum that a defeat might force him to call new elections, though he has since said he will not resign. The defense begins its case Thursday in the state murder trial of Oklahoma bombing conspirator Terry Nichols. Prosecutors rested Friday after presenting evidence over 29 days that they say links Nichols to the bombing. Nichols faces the death penalty if convicted. And that's the latest from the Court TV News Center. I'm Monica Pergament. Trial Heat with Lisa Bloom and James Curtis returns after the break. It's got everything. The Forenza. Honey, this looks expensive. This is so me, Dad. Ow! It's got a CD player, eight speakers, controls on the steering wheel. Wait a minute. More room than Civic. And America's number one warranty. That's very good. Air conditioning, power, everything. It's, it's perfect. perfect. The new Suzuki Forenza. Thousands less than Civic. No matter how you look at it, it's one smart move. We are live. Lynn Turner is accused of murdering her husband in 1995. This is one of his friends testifying about Lynn's suspicious behavior when her husband got sick. Let's listen. Did she relate to you that she had gone back home around noon or any time to check on him? No. She indicated she had called anybody to go check on him? Yeah. No. He's leading with a good bit of leading go, but... Response. I don't believe it's a leading question, but I'll... I'll be glad to rephrase it, all right? If you'll, if you'll rephrase it, then the judge won't have to rule. 